Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, having to confront a traumatic past can bring up a pretty wide range of emotions, and uh, if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more, as always. Uh, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And, you know, between us, if you like how we do things around here, we'd love it if you subscribe to the podcast. Give us uh, that big like, give, it that, give us that five-star rating, and subscribe. You can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, uh, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And also, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also... Uh, Do not hesitate to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram at either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large, because if we love to... Uh, watch it and write about it and talk about it. We love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit. On this episode, we got an interesting one. We're diving into the film Cosmic Dawn, which is available on Video On Demand platforms now, and I do believe on DVD and Blu-ray from uh, with our friends south of the border in the States, but it is from writer-director Jefferson Mineo, who we had the unique pleasure of talking with, and it's about uh, uh, this young girl, Aurora, who witnesses the alien abduction of her mother as a child, and uh, she joins, and she is forced to join a cult called the Cosmic Dawn, but now, years later, she's moved on from the cult and has nothing to do with them anymore, but things tend to come back around, and she is forced to confront her past and pursue the ultimate truth about what the Cosmic Dawn really is it's uh i'll admit i'll admit this one's a little out there but it's a it's really an interesting tale of just being able to having to confront the past and sort of putting it inside the a a genre setting and uh again i mean i'll admit i'm a sucker for alien and alien abductions and this uh this this hits on some pretty interesting points and we talked with uh writer director jefferson mineo about that and sort of his influences and so very much more and uh it was a good talk but uh check make sure you check out cosmic dawn on uh, video on demand platforms everywhere but uh more importantly check out our talk with jefferson if you sound remotely interested in this movie because uh between you and me it's a good one all right well jefferson obviously first off just thank you for the time today man i really appreciate this yeah thanks for inviting me now i mean i guess my first question is my i just watched the movie man i really enjoyed it but i mean i'll admit it's a little out there man there's a lot to unpack in this one like walk me through i guess the initial idea or inspiration for the story uh well i i started off i was going to write something about satanic cults okay uh, so it was going to be much darker and then i was just like i don't know if i want to live in that dark of a dark of a world and i was working at a a coffee shop kind of around i was living in vancouver at the time and i would notice uh this woman come in sort of regularly most of the most of the days that i was there and she would sit down sort of ingratiate herself with other people sit down invite herself to sit down uh with different people and i noticed after a while she was maybe in her late 30s early 40s and i noticed after a while that she was talking with predominantly younger people, maybe, maybe possibly runaways, maybe, I'm not sure. They all sort of fit a sort of, sort of lost, this kind of lost vibe to them, uh, sort of younger in their, in their early twenties. And, and I would notice after a while that sometimes their conversations would end and they would be weeping and she would be hugging them and all this stuff. And then one day she asked if she could sit down with me. So she, I said, sure. Cause I was kind of curious what this was all about. And she was from, this group called Radiant Rose in Vancouver, which you could, I, they, I don't think they would call themselves a cult, but I think it's very kind of similar in a, in a lot of ways, shares a lot of the same sort of tendencies and stuff like that. Um, and then, so that led me to sort of look into sort of, okay, well, what is Radiant Rose? Cause I, I had an interest in that. And that led me to Ekinkar. And then that led me to 
uh, like sannyasins, and then that led me to source family and, and all these different sort of new agey occultist kind of groups. And as a filmmaker, I'm interested in working in genre. So I wanted to kind of give it a genre feel. So that, that led to, uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to do a sci-fi because one thing that, that happened to me when I was younger, I had a, a, a grandmother and grandfather who owned a ranch, had a ranch in Southern Saskatchewan. And one night I was there and kind of woke up and, and the clock was like 1132 and there was all these, all this kind of brilliant light in my room. And I came downstairs and my grandmother was out in the yard looking up at the sky and there are all these like bright lights in the sky. Um, I didn't know what it was. She didn't know what it was. And then just kind of almost like got vacuumed away and it was gone. And I remember going back up, we were dumbfounded. My grandmother went and woke my grandfather up. He thought uh, it must have been Northern Lights. It must have been, if it wasn't that, then it must have been whatever, a plane or something, whatever. He rationalized it away. And I went back up to the room and, my, and the clock, it was one of those digital clocks, you know, with the red, red numbers. And the clock was now at 1124. So it was this unexplained experience and anybody that I ever told that story to, even, even to this day, has just always been, ah, well, there must be some reason, whatever. I don't know if I believe all this. So because the nature of, of cults, you know, it's all sort of belief. What, what is the belief system? What sort of, what are the set of beliefs offer to people? And the fact that I was interested in doing genre and I had this experience, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make it about a UFO cult because it's, it's, if, if it's about belief, then it's, this is something that People have never really kind of always been very skeptical. It's like if you've ever heard anybody tell a ghost story, people are very skeptical of those as well. Um, and so that all sort of fed into, you know, I was interested in doing cults because I was interested in sort of the nature of belief and I was interested in working with genre. And I met this woman from Radiant Rose and that led to all this research and then trying to take a personal experience and sort of, you know, shape it into, into a story. So that's kind of how, how Cosmic Dawn came about. Well, I mean, I love that story because, I mean, I think the thing about the film that really appeals to me is that, I mean, at least for most of it, uh, it, it, it seems to be walking back and forth between skeptic and serious and skeptic and serious. And it felt very important to not sort of lean one way or the other until you absolutely had to. How important was it for you to sort of, I guess, put that sense of doubt, especially mm -hmm. as you're sort of in the middle of this sort of cult-like environment? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think that's that's really what the story to me is about. It's about this sort of intersection between belief and doubt, you know, and I don't think one can kind of exist without the without the other in a, in a way. Right. So that's sort of how the film is structured. That's sort of like the narrative thrust of the story as we give you we give you some belief and then we introduce some doubt and then we introduce more belief and then we introduce a little bit more doubt. And so from an audience perspective, I mean, what I was trying to do is is sort of draw a line in the sand with with the audience and be like do you believe or do you are you skeptical like do you believe that these these people all had the experience that they had or do you think that they're all full of shit you know is, for sure yeah is is at least the cult leader uh you know a shaman or is she a charlatan yeah you know and that's sort of sort of the the line that the the, the tightrope that the film walks no and i mean i i think you achieve that so well i mean especially in some of the casting because i mean C camille almost really feels like this i mean it's a it's a weird trope to even use but sort of that final girl and sort of the sci-fi and sort of horror genres and she, she's walking that line between sort of heroine and sort of tough and strong but also vulnerable at the same time can you talk to me a little bit about just finding the right people for the right parts because if if you have people who aren't necessarily embracing the material like you need to i don't think this works at all yeah well, I mean, to me, Camille, what attracted me to her, she had this, this vulnerability mm. to her. Um, and she, I cast her because I had been sent, uh, we were casting the film and her manager had sent me like a taped audition she had done for another film. And it was maybe a five minute, five minute tape or something. And three minutes into it, I was like, when is this, when is this going to start? Cause she's just, it just seemed like she was having a conversation with somebody off camera. It didn't actually seem like she was running lines. And then I realized, no, this is the performance because at the end she kind of came out of that character. And I was like, wow, that like, and the, and the, 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 the audition that I saw involved vulnerability in a way. And it was just not apparent. It was like invisible to me uh, when I watched it. And so I was like, that's, that's what I need the character to, 
to have really. They need to have this vulnerability, this sort of like brokenness uh, to them, but also this really, uh, you want to be empathetic, right? Like, I, I think it's easy to have empathy for her. You know, she's able to be vulnerable, but you, she also has this really kind of empathetic, like quality to her as a, as a performer. Um, and so that's, that's how she, she came about. And then I just want, and then for Natalie, which is Emmanuel Shariki, I just wanted somebody who, who could play like bat shit insane. You'd be like, <laughs> you are a fucking crazy person. And Emmanuel is just great. I mean, I think she's fantastic in the film. And, and so I cast her because of that, uh, you know, she, and, and she really got the role, you know, like I, I had, I had spoken with her before, before, you know, as we were casting and she knew the role, she knew like what was needed of the role. She was, she really got this sort of belief and doubt sort of line that the film was walking. And, and so she was great. And then for at least for our cult leader, uh, we wanted somebody who was not a native uh, English speaker. We wanted somebody from a different country because in the film, in the world of the film, these cult members have come from, they've congregated, they've all come right. from all different places around the world. So we wanted somebody that sort of had a mysterious past that probably was from another country originally that so you can't really know, you know, their background, all of that. So that was, that was important. Um, and so we cast Antonia Zegers, who's, who's from Chile who's very well known in, in, in Chile, but this is her first English language film. Um, and then uh, Josh Burge, who I wanted somebody that had like a striking kind of look to uh, to him. And I just love uh, Joel Pedroikas' film. So, I mean, I think he's great and relaxer. And um, uh, so th that's how, how Josh got cast. I just wanted somebody really, really unique looking mm -hmm. for that role. Um, who also is, you know, a great actor, obviously goes without saying. And, and for Dieter, that's just Phil Granger. Phil Granger is just, is just a lovable weirdo that I, I've known and loved and worked with. And he's a really good friend of mine. And, and so I was like, I need, I need a grade A weirdo for this role. So I knew exactly who to call, which is Phil Granger. Well, and I mean, I think you're absolutely right because there is something else that the film really unpacks is just sort of this need to belong and how people can kind of get lost in that. And especially with Antonia's performance as she's kind of roping people in, there really is this, it's the subtle sinisterness that I, I think really sort of hits it home for me because there's obviously stuff going on, but you're never you're never on solid ground. And I mean, when you're, when you're, you're getting these characters to sort of buy into the material and do it, how do you sort of direct them into sort of like putting them in a universe where really they don't like, they don't necessarily have like solid footing under their feet from a character standpoint, they're trying to figure out which way is up kind of thing. Well, again, I just think it's, it's the thing that made it easy is that these characters are all predisposed to, and you find this just, you know, like with any, any cult, any, any group, people are predisposed to, to believe in something, right? It's yeah. like, what are they, what are they missing? Right. So they want to believe in this. And so you're willing to overlook that stuff. You know, the red flags, you're I'll overlook the red flags because my need to believe is so strong that I'm going to make what could, you know, be looked at as irrational decisions because they feed into this need, this desire to believe. Right. And so in, in, in talking and working with the actors, it was just, they all need to believe. So they're going to overlook that stuff. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have this doubt or that they're not, these red flags aren't going to go off, but they're going to rationalize. So rather than rationalizing uh, the belief, like trying to rationalize a way around the UFO thing, you're going to rationalize the red flags. Well, that they, I'm going to overlook that because that is part of the belief, right? Like I, you know, I'm going to overlook these certain things because my, my need to believe is so strong. Right. So now, I mean, there's one scene in the movie in particular without getting too much away. It felt like a real uh, pivot point. Just, I mean, for, for lack of a better description, I'll call it the quote unquote musical number. Mm -hmm. It felt like the moment in the film where you couldn't overlook anymore. You couldn't sort of, you couldn't embrace the belief for like, you couldn't embrace the need to believe versus what was going on and what you were seeing. Like how in, how important was it to have, I guess, maybe something where for the characters involved, it was like, okay, maybe I can't overlook this anymore to have that pivot point. Cause I mean, at least for me, I think that was the moment where I was like, okay, all bets are off. I've got to sort of start thinking my way out of this as opposed to sort of rationalizing it and judging it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think in a way, I think it comes earlier for the audience because, because we've been, I've, you know, we're introducing little bits of doubt. 
And right. I think once once you get to that moment, you're like, okay, these people are. I mean, they're off their rocker. <laughs> like, look at what they're doing right now. Like, this is it's crazy. I mean, they look like they're having a lot of fun, but man, that's very strange, right? And it's not. It's I think maybe it's like a scene or two after that when the character catches up to it, when Aurora catches up to it. You know, when she when she really something happens with with her friend Natalie at, sure. at this at this group's compound. That, yeah. That really, that's when, when she really starts questioning everything around her. But I think the moment where we're like, okay, all bets are off as an audience are there. But at that moment, Aurora, you know, our main, our protagonist is completely in, in, in thrall to this, to this group. Right. So she, she's overlooked all this stuff leading up to the point where I'm literally going to dance around like a, like an insane, <laughs> insane person to a karaoke song, you know? Now, I mean, I'm curious because, I mean, you had mentioned earlier just about wanting to work in genre. And obviously, I mean, Muddy, which I'm a big fan of, is noir and it was a great, great film. But again, when you really dive into genres, there's also commentary in there as well. And I mean, I'm kind of curious, what is it about sort of leaning into any specific genre that allows the ability for filmmakers and storytellers to actually say something relevant and meaningful, because I don't think we're getting sort of these sort of moments of social commentary out of like a rom-com kind of thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it's because there's, it's, it, there's like an archetypical structure, right? So audiences are, are come into these films with a certain set of expectations and that as, as it's, it's a lot easier to, sort of subvert expectations mm -hmm. or do, you know, twist in the genre and do something, put a different kind of spin on it. When you have these expectations, these sort of audience demands already sort of in front of you. Um, whereas I guess, I mean, I guess there is, you know, in the rom-com, there are a certain set of expectations there too. Uh, but I don't know, you don't, you don't get blood, you don't get violence, you don't right. get you know, all, all these other things that are very powerful. Right. So, um, I mean, that's what, that's what interests me. And also just genre films are more fun to make, you know, I mean, just kill me now. If I got to make a movie about suffering, I don't want to make movies about suffering. You know, I want to, I want to have fun with what I, what I do. You know, I want to look forward to, I want to sit behind the monitor on set and just laugh with how much fun I'm having rather than, than uh, overwrought emotion and stuff like that. You know, and that's, there's, there's, you know, people love all sorts of different films, but for me personally, I just want to have fun. I want my audience to have fun, you know, and hopefully, you know, make, make a meaningful film at the same time too. I think both things are possible. No, and you're right. It's a different set of stakes. You can, you can still say something meaningful without necessarily having to sort of bring the room down or pull the heartstrings like mm -hmm. some of those other films would. And I mean, I think this does this. And I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, this is a dumb question, but it's one I always like to ask. Dumb questions are my favorite. <laughs> the stupider, the better, man. Okay, it's not that stupid, but okay. uh, think back to the younger days. Like what were the movies for young Jefferson that had the light bulb go off and go, you know what? I need to do this. I need to be a filmmaker. I need to be a storyteller. Well, the first, the first, I mean, uh, this is not a very original thing, but it was Indiana Jones. I mean, okay. I, when I was like nine, 10, 11 years old, I used to make little stupid rip off Indiana Jones movies with my friends in the backyard. And we go down to the forest and run through the trees with, you know, a fedora and a leather jacket and a whip and whatever, all that stuff. So that, that was part of it. Right. And I think that's just, you know, being the age that you are, you're kind of only introduced to sort of massive sort of macro culture stuff when, when you're that young. Mm. Um, so that's definitely like what first got it, you know, I mean, it, probably like the Spielberg Lucas stuff is sort of what started it off. And then once I started actually making films, um, you know, I, I, you, you don't really see this. I don't think in my work, but um, days of heaven was an important film to me because that was the first time I'd ever seen, I grew up in Saskatchewan. So that was the first time I'd ever really seen uh, uh, like a, just a, a really great film that was set in the prairies with the wheat fields and all that. Cause I felt like, you know, stories I had heard about my, my, my ancestors and my relatives, right, and whatever, right. all that stuff. Right. So that was one, uh, but De Palma is a big, I mean, De Palma is my guy. You know, I, and, and I think that's, that's sort of even, 
like just now that I would say that's probably the touchstone for me that, you know, Paul Verhoeven is another guy that I really like as a, as a filmmaker and sort of trying to model my, my career after, you know, sort of going, going in that direction, because I think, you know, Verhoeven is a guy who, who definitely has something to say with every film and most of his films, you know, especially the sort of late eighties American ones like RoboCop and Total yeah. Recall and Basic Instinct and, showgirls and starship troopers you know into the 90s those films all have something you know really serious to say about about you know what the the subject matter even if they just sort of seem like a list b movies you know and de palma's kind of the same way you know i think de palma's can do sleazy he can do horror he can do comedy he can do whatever and and i think in a, in a way he sort of his commentary i think is more on audience expectation then then Verhoeven Verhoeven's maybe a little bit more sort of socio-politically minded with with his commentary but uh I think De Palma's a lot of commentary on on the active filmmaking and film viewing viewership in general right so I would say those two really are the biggest influence but as far as like what I started with I mean it's not not unique it's you know you're 10 years old you love Indiana Jones and Star Wars what can I say no, but I'm, gonna, man. I, I I'm love gonna lie about that <laughs> why should you man be proud no, exactly exactly well because i don't know some filmmakers come on and they're like oh i was watching antonioni i've then... only ever seen cassavetes yeah no, exactly. yeah ex- exactly i'm like you're full of shit no, you <laughs> you're watching batman or whatever you know i don't know but i mean i love that you brought up both rehoven and De palma because i mean i definitely think uh your films in general i mean especially this one sort of rides that line right in the middle because, I mean, Cosmic Dawn is kind of saying something about sort of that overwhelming need to believe and sort of issues around loss and how it can affect people, but also it's taking us on a hell of a ride too, man. Mm-hmm. And it's sometimes you just have to sort of strap in and go with it. And I mean, I think that's what you did here with this film and uh, I enjoyed the hell out of it and I enjoyed the hell out of talking to you today. So just thanks for the time and uh, congratulations again on the film. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. It's been fun. And don't forget to to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.